So welcome to this uh, course on quantum computing and quantum machine learning. The uh, uh, I wanted to give you in the beginning here just some general information. Uh, the lectures will be recorded. The uh, course is actually meant as a kind of self-study course, which means in principle that we uh, may not have lectures, but I actually wanted to uh, have uh, some weekly sessions where we meet and uh, go through material and indicate uh, where we can find additional reading material. Uh, the um, books which I have uh, found, which you may find useful, uh, is actually the book by Maria Schult and Francesco Petruccione. You can download this for free if you're on a university IP number. The same with uh, the textbook by Wolfgang Scherer. And I think you can also find the textbook by Robert Hunt. I think the University of Oslo offers that one uh, in the sense that the Cambridge as a publisher allows you to download chapter by chapter. But the first two ones are books which you can uh, download for free from the uh, subscription which the University of Oslo has to Springer. So I will actually follow in the beginning uh, a lot of the material which is covered by Wolfgang Scherer. Now, there is a uh, tentative schedule here, but I received an email from uh, two of you. So as of now, we are seven people which have registered. And uh, we tentatively put Mondays uh, 12.15 to 2 p.m. as a meeting time. Uh, however, the uh, if that doesn't work, I mean, we may actually consider to change uh, time. So I'm going to send you a uh, poll. Uh, where you can actually fill in which times could fit. Uh, I am actually uh, not in Norway this semester, but today I actually happen to be in Norway because uh, we had a family emergency, so I had to visit my parents. But normally I would be six hours uh, behind you. The uh, uh, topic this week was more to go through some basic uh, quantum mechanics and uh, set up uh, the some of the definitions which are needed. Uh, you will find my lecture notes if you click uh, on this link here. And the recommended reading this semester, now this uh, this week, is uh, Scherer's book on mathematics of quantum computations in chapter two. And uh, I will try to cover uh, a lot of that material which is in there. Now, there's one thing I wanted uh, to ask you about, and I need input from you guys here. If you look at the uh, UIO uh, description of the course, if you now go scroll down a little bit and you look at the teaching and examination. So this is something to be decided upon. So the administration has a kind of default because they have a, a tendency to not like uh, project-based courses. So what has been done here is to propose that we have something like uh, uh, free uh, projects. So it says that the course is based on self-assigned studies. Uh, I would like to recommend here that we actually try to meet weekly and that we go through material. Uh, I have prepared uh, lecture notes, which I thought we could use. And uh, that means that uh, there would be regular lectures with the uh, reading assignments. and. Uh, the uh, there's a so that the, we have quite some flexibility in the way we organize this course, and it says that uh, we have uh, uh, a specific number of projects, and uh, that one of these must be approved to uh, be able to take the final exam. And there's uh, a uh, I mean the examination is suggested as a hundred percent final ex oral examination. But this is something which we are flexible to change, but that depends upon you guys. So an alternative is that we have uh, two projects which could count something like one third of the grade, and then we could have a final oral examination where you would present the material from these projects. And that final examination, this is something which we cannot escape because the administration wants to have that. As I said, the administration of the physics department is not too fond of uh, project-based uh, courses. I don't know why. But we uh, can uh, uh, change the uh, the scale here so that the final or examination could be you presenting 
what you have done in these two projects. So this is something where I would need your input. So when I'm going to send you a, a mail with a, a, a possibility to revise the meeting time, uh, because we have two people who cannot attend, then uh, uh, I was also thinking of asking about uh, uh, how you feel uh, about the way we are going to uh, grade here, whether you want to have two kind of midterm-like projects, which count one-third each, and then a final or examination, which counts one-third. So this is very much up to you, but we, if you wish to, you can, you can unmute yourself now or just put some comments in the chat or just uh, answer the, the mail, which I'm going to send everybody about the possible uh, examination form. So this is, uh, this is gonna be up to you guys a little bit. I am very flexible with that. And as you know, I prefer normally project-based teachers. Any questions so far? I mean, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, if there are questions or something is unclear, Else, you will find everything in, at the GitHub address, and I'm going to put that one into the chat here. And you probably have seen that on the main page as well, but I'm going to paste it back in the chat so you have it immediately. And this is uh, where I'm going to place all the teaching material. So if you scroll down here, uh, you will see now that for the first week, we are basically going to repeat uh, some basic concepts in quantum mechanics and try to link these up to uh, the uh, topics which we are going to cover here. And this is essentially a, for many of you, it's gonna be like a kind of repetition of basic quantum mechanic quantities. And then uh, we are going to continue with uh, uh, some of the basic uh, descriptions. We're going to look at the tensor products of Hilbert spaces, uh, simple Hamiltonians and other operators, how to uh, perform quantum operations, and then this goes down to quantities which are more relevant for quantum computing, like uh, density matrices, uh, Schmidt decompositions, and discussions of entanglement and why this is important. And uh, we are going to continue then, and we are going to look more at quantum gates and circuits for elementary calculations and measurements. And then we get into quantum Fourier transforms and specific Hamiltonians. So I was thinking that perhaps the, uh, the first project could deal with us so the focus here is going to be more on using quantum computing to simulate uh, quantum mechanical systems. And there is a, a, a model Hamiltonian which can easily be translated into uh, uh, Pauli matrices and thereby specific quantum gates. This is called the, this is called the Lipkin Hamiltonian. Please, yeah, there's some question. Sorry, sorry, it was just the sound. Uh, say it again. I, I didn't hear properly here. I couldn't. I couldn't hear you. Oh, it's just some noise. Just some noise. Okay. Sorry for that. Sorry. Okay. Okay. I thought there was a question actually. Okay. So the uh, and then the uh, uh, we are going to look at algorithms for solving quantum mechanical problems, and there are two famous algorithms. One is called the variational quantum eigensolver, and then we have phase estimation algorithm. So the uh, the first uh, project slash midterm is going to rotate around uh, solving a, a specific quantum mechanical uh, Hamiltonian model uh, with uh, me these methods for quantum computing. But we need some time to build up the, uh, the basic mathematics behind it. And so we are going to analyze and discuss this and that will form the first uh, uh, kind of midterm. And then we are going to look at, uh, since this is a Hamiltonian which can easily be translated into uh, quantum gates, and in, in our case, uh, specific uh, uh, Pauli matrices, then we don't need to think of uh, second quantization and things like jordan Wigner transformation and the suzuki trot approximation, et cetera, et cetera. But these are things which we'll look at later. And then we have a, a pretty open uh, schedule for the end here. So, so this is a, um, a course which ideally uh, can be tailored to your interests. This is also something which we need input from you guys. So many of these topics which you see here, they were taught as uh, self-study courses and in Norwegian this would call, be called special pensum. 
which again translates into a special topic. And often these uh, special topics were designed uh, to your specific interests. So it could be that the topics which I'm proposing here are not that interesting and that you have something else you would like to follow up. And we can uh, very well actually design uh, a path which is more tailored to your own interests. So this would be the kind of basic material which you will often find in many courses on quantum computing. And my idea here was more to use the first, let's say, nine to 10 weeks to cover uh, what is seen as a basic input to simulating quantum mechanical systems with algorithms from quantum computing. And then we have the possibility later uh, to introduce topics from quantum machine learning, which then if you go back again, uh, some of these topics will be covered by the textbook by Maria Schulte and Francesco Petruccione. But in the beginning, uh, we will mainly deal with uh, specific chapters from uh, the book by Scherer and also the book by Hunt, which is also a very useful book, which has also many computationally interesting exercises. And it contains also a consistent development of uh, codes to deal with the different properties which we introduce week by week here. So any questions so far? Things which are unclear, uh, things you'd like to ask about? Feel free to unmute yourself here. So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. So everything is gonna be placed here and uh, you can easily look up things uh, if you go into these folders. So if I just give you one of the links here, you can then choose whether you want to look at the PDF or whether you want to look at the HTML version or just the Jupyter Notebook. So let me just show you the Jupyter Notebook here and then we bring up that one. So the Jupyter Notebook is going to look like something like this. And in the beginning here, there are actually some basic elements from linear algebra, Hilbert spaces, operators, etc., etc. And then the recommended reading will then be chapter two of, uh, of uh, this, this book here. And the uh, uh, kind of practicalities which we can uh, discuss, whether this fits you or not, is that we have weekly lectures with small weekly exercise assignments. We could actually work on two projects, which then will define the content of the course and the format can be agreed upon by us. Uh, but we could then, uh, just to summarize, look at topics like uh, quantum computing and simulation of quantum mechanical model systems. And then uh, we could take uh, two different paths where we have one path where we go more to into realistic systems, or we could think of uh, applying specific quantum machine, machine learning algorithms. And then there's a final uh, oral examination to be agreed upon. And you find all the material on the GitHub address, which you saw previously. And you can download this and just use that one to develop your own notes, if that is something you would like to do. And what's coming now is basically a definition of the specific quantities, which we will need. So I would like to, if it's okay with you guys, I would like to switch to the whiteboard. And then we are gonna use that one. And that slows down the pace a little bit instead of just reading slides here. So any questions so far? Things which are unclear? Feel free to uh, comment in the chat if you want to, or, or just unmute yourself and ask questions if that's, if you prefer that. Okay, so I'm gonna change to the uh, uh, whiteboard. So let's do that. Can uh, everybody see my whiteboard here? Okay, so one of the things which we need now is simply to start defining uh, some and remind ourselves of some basic uh, properties in quantum mechanics. So this is uh, in a way a repetition and we are going to define our basis states which we often will refer to either basis state 
or a computational basis. Now, there's one thing which I would like to say before we uh, uh, dive into more the mathematics here. And this deals a little bit about the way these things are covered in many more formal textbooks and the way these basis states are actually realized experimentally. Now, uh, when you are going to build a quantum computer, whether you use uh, uh, superconducting qubits, uh, whether you use quantum dot qubits or ion trap qubits or other of the existing technologies, what uh, is normally uh, needed is something which we would define as a computational basis from a complicated many particle system. So to give you an example of uh, the way we will rephrase these systems, suppose we have a, an example system which is now being used to really make uh, quantum gates. And that will illustrate a lot of the uh, kind of uh, problems which we face in realizing quantum computers. In this specific course, we are not going to put emphasis on that, but this is something which we will actually uh, use and refer to as a computational basis. But when we now define quantities like qubits, et cetera, et cetera, we will often pick some selected states which can be used experimentally to realize quantum gates. So uh, take now a uh, harmonic oscillator, which you, many of you may have met. And let's uh, look at the harmonic oscillator in uh, one dimension. So in the harmonic oscillator, what you have is a Hamiltonian. So let us define that one. And I'm going to define this as H0 because there is no interaction between the different particles, but there's only a one body Hamiltonian. So this one body Hamiltonian contains then the kinetic energy. So we will rewrite this one in terms of something which acts on a particle I with a specific uh, set of quantum numbers defined by this variable X and this uh, Hamiltonian is then defined by kinetic energy. And later we are going to skip the indices, you know, the uh, div different quantum mechanical constants like H bar, and we are going to skip masses. We're going to scale everything. So we get dimensionless units. So we have the kinetic energy, and then we have the harmonic oscillator potential, which then has this MI, there is an oscillator frequency, and then we have XI squared. And we know that in one dimension, this uh, Hamiltonian has an eigenbasis. So let's define this eigenbasis. And we are going to call this eigenbasis phi of alpha, where alpha now contains specific quantum numbers. So x of x of i is now going to be a common denominator for the position r of i and spin, if we are dealing with particles with spin. If these are spinless particles, we will obviously drop it. And in our case, R of i, since we're just in one dimension, that becomes just x of i. So I'm going to write it x of i, and I'm going to let the spin uh, just be one possible variable, but we will keep this x of i here. So I will rather let me just be a little bit more careful. So we should actually put an x of i tilde here to indicate that this is not that's the collective parameter x of i. So in general, when I write a uh, variable x of i, like here, that is going to contain spin and the spatial degrees of freedom. So when we are just in one dimension, this just translates into uh, uh, the spatial uh, degree of freedom, x of i. So this is the one dimensional coordinate which we have here. Uh, I may sloppily just switch this back to X and just not have this X of I tilde. But in general, the way I'm going to label the uh, quantum numbers of a specific uh, uh, single particle state, that is going to be described by X of I here, which contains the spatial degrees of freedom, 
the spin degrees of freedom, and then additional quantum numbers. So if you think of the harmonic oscillator then, what you would have is something like this phi of i of x of i, which then goes over to phi of nx with this x of i here. And this system has eigenstates when we act with this h of x of i, of this specific state of nx of x of i. This has eigenstates which are given by an energy, h bar omega, and then we have nx plus one half, since we are in one dimension. And this is multiplied with this single particle wave function, x of i here. Now, what does that mean? When we now look at the uh, harmonic oscillator potential, and we look at the specific eigenstates which we can have, so if we plot the harmonic oscillator potential, and now I'm just going to use this x as the spatial degrees of freedom. So if we plot v of x, and then we have x on the axis, so this is now just a one-dimensional spatial coordinate. What we have then, when we plot the potential, is that we have a discrete set of eigenvalues. And these eigenvalues are given by a difference of 1 h bar omega in here. So the harmonic oscillator is just an example of one specific type of Hamiltonian. So these states here, the first one, since this would correspond to nx equal to 0. So these numbers nx go from 0, 1, 2, and in principle to infinity. So the harmonic oscillator has an infinite amount of uh, bound single particle states. So this would have an energy of uh, E0, which then is simply h bar omega multiplied with a half. The next one has obviously nx equal to one. And we would label that as an n epsilon one. And that will be given by h bar omega multiplied with three half. And then you can continue like this. So in principle, we have an infinity of states. Another thing which I'm going to uh, set up now, but then define uh, more later, is that this specific state which we have now, this phi of nx of x of i, this is actually a tensor product of the spin degrees of freedom multiplied with the spatial degrees of freedom. So this is actually given by a tensor product of spatial and spin degrees of freedom. If we are dealing with fermions with for instance, spin and a half. So just to keep to remind you of that, suppose now this sigma of i is equal to one half. That means that we have the projections m s of i, which is plus one half and minus one half. This will then be indicated in terms of two spinors. So it means that the spin degrees of freedom, this spin sigma of i and this ms of i, that's going to be given by two states, one zero and zero one. And I am assuming that you have seen this before in courses in quantum mechanics. So this would correspond to, a, it could correspond to a spin-up case. So that means that we would label it with an arrow pointing up. And that corresponds to the case with the projection equal to plus one half. And then this one could correspond to a spin down case as we typically would call them, spin down. And then we would have an MS, MS of, MSI of minus a half here. So this will be the spin degrees of freedom. If we now look at the uh, spatial degrees of freedom, so assume now that we have a discrete 
single particle basis in the spatial degrees of freedom. So we have a discrete single particle sorry this is let me write it correctly single particle well positions and we could then describe a uh, state which we are going to call for a psi of uh, a given quantum number nx and this has now a, a discrete a set of positions with which describe this specific uh, state and we are going to write it like this and we could now think of this as a vector which now contains x0 x1 and I'm going to let X just be a spatial degree of freedom. So sometimes the notation can be a little bit confusing, but hopefully from the context, you will see now that when I previously defined X to contain both the spatial degrees of freedom and the spin degrees of freedom, what I'm doing here now is simply in a sloppy way to define this X just to be the spatial degrees of freedom. So we would now think of this as a set of discrete positions. In principle, we have an infinity of such positions. And we would define this specific function here as just a vector with uh, n elements. So we have x is now defined by the quantities x0. So this could be discretized positions of n minus 1. In principle, this is a continuous variable, but let's now assume that this is now given by a, a discrete set of single particle positions. That means that the state which we had is phi n of x of uh, now x here and then sigma is given by the tensor product of psi n x and this is the definition of the way you would write a tensor product multiplied with the spin degrees of freedom. So that means that we would now have a sigma i here, and that contains this sigma of i and then an ms of i here. And we will put, typically put labels of nx of i as well here. So let's write this like this. So this will be a quantum numbers which are now relevant for this specific particle. And that's defined by a set of spatial degrees of freedom. So the uh, quantum uh, the quantum numbers are now given by uh, the spins and this quantum numbers nx. If you go to two dimensions, it would be nx, ny, and nc. And this total state now, when we now look at the tensor product, just to remind you of that, this is the same as us now taking the tensor product of these two vectors, x0, x1, x n minus 1 and multiplied with uh, the uh, states which we have here sigma the spin states so if we assume that this one is now given by a spin up state this will simply now be given by an x0 x1 down to x n minus 1 and then multiplied with 1 0 and the tensor product is then obviously the same as x0 and then multiplied with 1, 0, x1 multiplied with 1, 0. And this goes down all the way down to xn minus 1 multiplied with 1, 0. So that would be the, the, that is the formal definition of the tensor product, which we are going to use uh, consistently in uh, in uh, later applications. Now, one of the things you will often see then is that this kind of tensor product is often written in a more compact way. So the typical way you would see this when we use the bracket notation is something like this. So you would have a, an nx. So we drop the x's. So for this specific state, nx of i. And then we would have a sigma of i. And then this uh, projection msi. So this would be a more compact way of writing that specific state. 
Any questions so far? So these are just definitions which we are going to use throughout the, uh, the course here. So a typical state is now going to be represented by a set of uh, uh, elements like we did here with this x0, uh, x1, up to xn minus 1. Uh, we are also going to uh, set up the uh, complex conjugates or the Hermitian conjugates of these specific states. So now we're going to just define this in a more general basis, more general. And we are going to use consistently the bracket notation. So if you see something like this vector x, this could now be given by x0, x1, down to xn minus one. So these are different components. Uh, in mathematics, you would typically see this defined in terms of a bold phase quantity. And this would be a vector, which is now defined for the complex numbers with a length n. Then we can obviously define the uh, emission conjugate of this one, which is then in our case, just going to be defined by the transpose of that vector. So this is x0 x1, but this is now the complex conjugate, x2 up to xn minus 1. This is this quantity which you see here is the same as obviously the transpose or the Hermitian conjugate of this vector. If this is a, uh, has real entries, this is just a transpose of that quantity. So that's the same as x. We also know that if we take x and take the transpose of that one and this, then we are just back to x again. So as an example, let's just look at a simple example here. Just to remind you of some of these basic quantities, and I hope you don't get offended if I remind you of some of these basic quantities. Your vector x could be 1 minus i and 2 plus i. And then we know that if we take the emission conjugate of this one, which is the same as x, this is the same as i plus 1. And then I have 2 minus i here. Now, uh, this is uh, the kind of uh, general type of notation which we are going to use. But I wanted to get back to the harmonic oscillator case. Now, uh, we are actually going to come back to this type of uh, basis sets which is offered by a specific Hamiltonian. Uh, because one, uh, it offers a complete orthogonal basis which is ex going to be extremely useful when we're going to do quantum computations. Secondly, uh, this kind of uh, basis set, which you, see, which you see here now, is often a basis set which uh, can mimic closely some realistic uh, implementations of uh, actually quantum systems, which are used to make quantum gates. So electrons which are being trapped in small regions in space, they can actually be confined, their motion can be confined by trapping them with electric potentials, which are almost harmonic oscillator lookalikes. So what you could think of now is you having an electron which is confined to move in a harmonic oscillator trap. Alternatively, you could think of trapping the electron in other ways, or if you're looking at the ion trap technology, you could actually trap ions in small regions in space, and this is a technology which is called ion trap technology, which is one of the popular candidates for making quantum states. But the important thing for us is that suppose now the electron lives here or it lives in this state. We could now think of singling out two specific states only. So in principle, our system is going to contain an infinity of basis states. You could think of these states, which we now define by these eigenstates, as a computational basis. And you will see later why this is something which is extremely useful. Now, when you have such a basis, 
what you could think of then, if it is possible, you could only pick one or two or some few selected states and identify them as your so-called qubit states. That means that you could now say that in this specific system here, we label this state as a state zero and the state which you see here as a state one. And if it is feasible experimentally, we could then just neglect all the other states and only focus on this two low lying state of this harmonic oscillator system. And then use these two low lying states as our computational basis. This is the foundation for making quantum mechanical gates. In principle, everything which we deal with, and that's something which gives rise to noise and errors in quantum computing, is that we are dealing with the quantum mechanical many particle systems, complicated many particle systems. So uh, I'm going to digress a little bit along these lines because this is going to serve as a kind of overarching motivation for many of the definitions which are going to deal with, but also the kind of studies which we will make a little bit later. So one of the popular systems like superfluid qubits, uh, the IBM super uh, quantum computers actually based on this technology, these are systems where we can identify states like this, this one and that one, low-lying state in a complicated many particle system, and then we can perform computations with these basis states. Coming back to the electrons in these quantum dot systems, these trapped electron systems, these actually systems which are realized in the laboratory, you could now thinking of having a series of such harmonic oscillator potentials, and in every such potential, there is an electron. And then, we could now single out some of the low lying states and say that these are our computational basis states, only these. And then we could try to make uh, quantum computing operations on a system of trapped electrons in different harmonic oscillator potentials. The interactions between them and things like thermal excitations for these specific systems, they can actually ruin many of the properties which we're going to look at later, like entanglement. Actually, the IBM supercomputers, they have a serious problems with thermal excitations because many of these systems are cooled down to zero temperature, which means that an excitation from this state up to that state could actually occur if the temperature is above a certain threshold. And that would ruin all kinds of computations which we are making with a computational basis which we have chosen. So I'm going to repeat many of these arguments again and again, because it takes some time to absorb the connection between real implementations and the mathematics, which you are going to see in most textbooks. So uh, if we now want to formalize a little bit of what we have done here, what you could say now is that a kind of first postulate is that every quantum system is described completely by a state vector. And all properties of the system can be deduced from this state vector. And every quantum system in that sense is its own state space, like this harmonic oscillator, which we've been looking at here. And quantum states are equivalent to positions in that space. Uh, the space, the state space is complex. And the position in the space are described in terms of these basis states. So for coming back to the harmonic oscillator, the positions of the particles is something which we can calculate as an expectation value based on these kind of basis states which we have defined here. So you could think of a, a first postulate for what we are doing that every quantum system is described completely by a state vector. So when we now look at this kind of abstract state vector, which we had down here, this could now form a kind of basis, which is used as a basis uh, state for the system, or as we will sloppily also call them, a computational basis. So if we now use this kind of Dirac notation, 
And suppose now we have defined a computational basis for this harmonic oscillator. We are now going to simplify the notation a little bit so we don't need to carry with us all these specific quantum numbers. So what we did in the case here was actually to look in more detail at the harmonic oscillator and spell out all the possible quantum numbers which define the system. But let's now just simplify things a little bit and say that we have, so if we now look at this kind of first postulate, which we are going to carry with us, and then we take a break after this. So every quantum system, let me just write this down. So every quantum system is described completely by a state vector or state vectors by a set of state vectors. And these state vectors are normally orthogonal. So we have a set of state vectors and all properties of the system can then be computed based on these state vectors. Can be or can be deducted, can be deducted from the state vectors. So what we're going to assume now is that these state vectors are form a basis, which is an eigen basis of a specific Hamiltonian. So. The, one of the assumptions now, assume now that we have a set of such state vectors. And let's label these in the following way. So I'm gonna have a set of state vectors, which I'm just gonna call for phi, and I'm gonna use this Dirac notation, phi zero, phi one, up to phi of n minus one. So these are our state vectors. These state vectors are now the eigenstates of a specific operator. And we are going to often use these eigenstates or state vectors to be a basis of a specific part of the full Hamiltonian. So we will often select some parts of the uh, energy Hamiltonian to have, for instance, analytical solutions like the ones which we saw for the harmonic oscillator. Now, this, so these state vectors, they form an orthogonal basis. So it means that the basis states, when we now look at this, is actually given by the Kronecker delta, delta ij, which means that's one if i is equal to j and zero else. In quantum mechanics, this is normally given by an integral, but we are going to just leave that out now. That means that I can actually set up a new state vector we can define a new state, can define a new state, which I'm gonna call for Psi here, and which is going to be a linear combination of all these states. So now I'm just using the properties of an orthogonal basis, and we are going to assume that this basis, as you can see here, is orthogonal and normalized. We normally use to call this sloppily an orthonormal basis, you will often see this uh, shortened to a uh, uh, acronym ONB, orthogonalized and normalized basis. So we can define a new state, which is now a linear combination in terms of all these other basis states, which we have here, this phi, phi zero plus an A1 of phi one, and all the way up to A n minus one of phi n minus one. And we will typically rewrite this in terms of a sum from i equals zero up to n minus one. And then we have these coefficients a of i multiplied with the phi of i's. And we know that these coefficients, the a of i's 
they are just given by the overlap between the state psi and phi of i here. So it means that the basis which we have, this phi basis, that allows us to describe any point in the state space of the system. So the basis states, which we have here, which we have chosen, and as I mentioned in the previous example, this could be the harmonic oscillator basis. So the basis which we have here, which now contains all these phi i's, allows us to use or to describe any point in state space. in the state space of the system. And uh, we will often uh, then set up this kind of uh, state, uh, which we have defined here, this psi, in terms of these uh, uh, coefficients, a0, a1, etc., etc. So, uh, if we now want to specialize to only two specific states, we could now think of these as our qubit states. And uh, uh, that means that if we go back to what we defined in the very beginning with the harmonic oscillator, so in principle, we have an infinity of states, but let's now assume that we just single out two possible states. And we are going to use these two states. This could be the states of a single particle, which is trapped in a specific potential well, or it could be the two lowest lying states in a quantum mechanical many body system. So in a certain sense, we don't need to be that uh, specific whether these uh, states zero and one are resulting from a single particle uh, type of system or a many particle type of system. So another candidate system for making quantum gates in order to set up quantum circuits and perform quantum computations is a system in semiconductor physics, which is called point defects. So these are often systems where you have some balanced particles which have been knocked out in composite systems like silicon carbide. Diamond is one of the candidate systems for making quantum com for materials for quantum computing. And where you can actually identify some low-lying states, which you can use as computational basis states. So in all textbooks, you will simply see people assuming that we have a state zero and a state one, and that these can be used to define a single qubit. In principle, these could be single particle states for like this electron, which is trapped in a harmonic oscillator well. And you could think of that harmonic oscillator well as an isolated system, which does not interact strongly with the environment. If you have strong interactions with the environment, that could lead to, for instance, thermal excitations. And you would then destroy this approximation with just a basis containing zero and one. But let's now simplify things and assume that we have defined such a basis. So this kind of first postulate now deals with a complete basis, but we could now define what's going to be, we are going to use as a quantum notation for qubits. And now it fits to take a small break. So what I'm going to do now is to uh, look at uh, this uh, basic notation for qubits. And uh, you have to think of these as uh, idealization of uh, uh, a complicated quantum mechanical system where we often would just single out uh, two states. And these two states will uh, are normally being used in the construction of uh, quantum gates and quantum circuits and they will often be labeled as a computational basis states. So let's uh, go back to the uh, uh, whiteboard and uh, try to wrap up some of these definitions so that next week we can actually move on a little bit further. So let me just bring this down. So if we now look at this uh, uh, 
basis. So if we have a qubit, it, we could have a system where we have singled out uh, the two lowest lying states. And this could be a single particle system like this harmonic oscillator we looked at, or it could be a complicated many particle system. Now we are going to label these two states as state zero and one. And then we are going to use this notation here with the uh, same notation which we used for the spin states. And we're going to label these as two vectors, zero and one. Now you quickly see here that uh, if you're looking at the discretization of a set of uh, uh, X values on a grid, you could then have uh, hundred points. And that means that you would have a uh, hundred vectors here, which all will be orthogonal. And you see immediately here when you perform the operations that if you take the inner product of zero and zero and the inner product of one and one, that is the same as just one. And if you take two or the other, one or the other combination, this is actually equal to zero. And that is pretty easy to see. And that's normally what we would call the inner product of two vectors. And if we take uh, uh, and, and write this in a more general form, and suppose now that we just have a vector x and a vector y. So let's now define the inner product. Between two specific vectors. So this would be general vectors between x and y, and these vectors have the same length, and these are complex numbers. So it's element between uh, of a vector of vector length n, and these are complex numbers, could also be real numbers. The inner product then is something which we would write out as y times x. And if we now write it out in the uh, vector notation, this would be y0, y1 complex conjugate, up to y n minus one complex conjugate. And this is now multiplied with the x zero, x one down to x n minus one. So quantum computing in a way, if you want to uh, view it from a mathematical, purely mathematical point of view, it's essentially applied linear algebra. And this is something which you would then rewrite as a sum over i equals zero up to n minus one. And then we would have y of i complex conjugate multiplied with x of i. Now, what we did up here was simply to take this simpler basis, which now just has two elements. And this is normally called the qubit basis. And we can now make a, a general state in terms of these two computational basis states. So we would call these for basis states, these two states here, or computational basis states. And then we can actually set up a general qubit state, which is a linear combination of these two states, a general qubit state. And next week, we are going to look at the, the specific operations on these states in terms of uh, poly matrices and other matrices. So a general qubit state, which we then can uh, label in terms of the state psi, which we had before, that will be given by A0, times the first vector and a1 times the second vector. And we will often write this now, if you now look at what this looks like mathematically, this is simply a1 and a0 multiplied with the two vectors which we have. So this will then be given in terms of a vector, a0 and a1. And then you see now that the uh, corresponding bra state if we now look at the, this would be the Hermitian conjugate, that would be the same as A0 complex conjugate. So A0 and A1 are complex numbers in principle, multiplied with zero plus A1 complex conjugate multiplied with one. And we would then write this as A0 and A1 complex conjugate. Now, so that means that the, the way we set up the states also gives us the uh, bra state. We would normally call this for the bra state using this uh, Dirac bracket notation. So I will sloppily call this a bra state, which also means that I'm going to call this for the cat state. So this is just some kind of physics jargon which I'm introducing at this stage here. So bra states, they are just row vectors 
and obviously cat states are column vectors. And the basic vectors are the conjugates of the basis in the cat uh, space and the coefficients, they are just the complex conjugates of the coefficients in the cat space when we are, when we are dealt with the bra states. So for the bra states, the basis vectors are the conjugates of the basis in cat space. And similarly, the coefficients have to be the complex conjugates. And then we can define the general inner products. So suppose now we have two such states. So a general inner product between two such states. So we would have the state psi, and they have to have the same length. And suppose we have a state uh, beta. And these states are now given as a linear combination of the same uh, computational basis states. So we have the computational basis, or just simply the basis states. And we use this kind of general label phi. So we have phi of i is the computational basis states. And in our case, we had just limited ourselves to two of these. But if we want to be a little bit more general, it means that we would have this state psi, which would simply now be given by the linear combination from i equals zero up to n minus one. And then we have these coefficients a of i multiplied with the basis states phi of i. And then we could think of this beta as a new vector, which is a linear combination with the same length as previously with coefficients b of i, and then I have the same basis states phi of i. So if I'm now computing the inner product of these states, then this means that we would calculate something like this, or it's a mission conjugate. And this would now be given by the sum over i, and I'm skipping the, the limits. I would have an a of i, and this is multiplied with phi of i, which is an orthogonal and normalized basis, and multiplied with a sum over j of bj of phi j. So these are just two sums which are being multiplied. And we know that this becomes equal to a double sum of ij. And then I have my ai of bj multiplied with phi i of phi j. And since we have assumed that the basis is an orthogonal and normalized basis, so this would typically be called ONB, then we know that this has to be equal to a Kronecker delta. And this simply reduces to a sum over i, where we have A of i and B of i. And that is the inner product between these two states, which we have here. Now, for the simpler case where we just had uh, two such vectors, zero and one, then this clearly simplifies to just two terms. So for the qubit basis, which we have chosen, for the qubit basis, basis, what we have then is that we chose zero and one, and we know that the uh, inner products between one and zero is equal to zero, as we defined before the break, and this is equal to one, and that means that uh, if we now have two vectors, so if we have a phi, let's call this phi one, that's good, that would be given by the coefficients a zero and a one. And then I could think of a vector phi two here, and that could be given by these coefficients b zero and b one. Then in that specific case, what we have is that phi one of phi two is equal to a0 of b0 plus a1 times b1. So if, uh, if this uh, product is equal to one, this inner product, then we would say that the basis states, and if we then take psi1 and psi2 to be an orthogonal basis, then psi1 has to be equal to psi2, else this would be zero, and then if it's equal to one, we say that also the basis is normalized. Now, when we are making such type of transformations, what we also would have is that the transformations are governed by so-called unitary transformations. And that's something we will come back to next week. 
when we are looking at some basic definitions here. Now, there's another thing to keep in mind is that uh, uh, when we have two different vectors, that does not, uh, it's a small note, note that if we have two different vectors, we have two different And let's just call these two vectors for this psi one and psi two. Then it may not happen that psi one and psi two is equal to psi two and psi one. So that may not be the case. So let's look at an example, just to remind you of some basics of the uh, complex numbers and uh, uh, conjugation of vectors. So suppose now that we have defined a vector psi one, which now contains three components. So we have minus one and we have two of i and we have one. And let's put psi two equal to one, zero and i. Then if I calculate psi one and psi two, it's easy to see that this is going to give you minus one plus i, if you do the math here. If I then calculate psi two multiply with psi one, then what we're going to get is actually minus one and minus i. So they're actually not the same. And this uh, actually leads to an important rule leads to a rule which you may have seen before. So this is something which is uh, okay to keep in keep track of. So it means that if I take psi one, psi two, and I take the complex conjugate of that one, that is going to be equal to psi two with psi one here. Now this is just a small aside, uh, which is useful to keep in mind. And two vectors are orthogonal if the inner products are equal uh, to zero. And uh, typically for two, if you're thinking of this as a vectors in two dimensions, you can visualize that as two vectors which are being perpendicular. So in two dimensions, you can make some pretty easy geometric interpretation here. Now, there's another thing which we uh, uh, need to think of, and that's a, an operation which is called outer product. So let me just bring that up immediately. And a typical outer product now, suppose we have a vector uh, which we just label as X and that contains a given number of components, X zero, X one, X n minus one. And we compute the outer product of X with X. That's going to be given by a matrix. So it's not gonna be a scalar like we had within the product. So this is just to remind you of what the outer product is. So this will be X times X zero complex conjugate, X zero times X one complex conjugate. And this goes all the way to the final element, X n minus one complex conjugate. And we will just proceed here with X zero, et cetera. And then all the way down to X n minus one times X zero complex conjugate. And this goes all the way up to X n minus one times X n minus one complex conjugate. Now, this leads us now to some specific uh, uh, operators, which we are going to define just in, uh, in some few moments. So if we now look at the, our basis X in terms of the state one zero, then if I take the outer product of that one, then I have one zero multiplied with one, zero, and that gives me the following matrix, one, zero, zero, zero. Then I could define, uh, alternatively, I could take or, and I could define X to be zero, one. And in that case, what I get is that X times X is now going to be equal to zero, 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 and one. 
Now, if we now look at the, the kind of computational basis, which we defined. So if we now look at the computational basis, phi zero, which is now given by one and zero and phi one, zero and one, just an example here. Then you see that we can define the completeness, which actually gives us a matrix with ones along the diagonal. This is now going to be the sum from i equals zero up to n minus one, which in our case is just one. And then we can just write this out as a phi of i times phi of i. So this is our computational basis. And you see that in this specific case with these two states, this becomes simply one, one, zero, and zero. And in more general, what we have, in more general terms, What we have now is that this completeness relation is now simply given by the outer product of these basis or computational basis states, which we have chosen. Now, this uh, allows us now to uh, uh, play around a little bit with uh, some of these uh, uh, quantities. Now, what we could say now, when we look at this uh, case where we just have phi zero and phi one, We could actually rewrite that completeness relation in terms of uh, these two uh, contributions, zero, 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 one. And this is the same as phi zero times phi zero. And this is the same as phi one times phi one. Uh, we can now uh, define uh, an operation or an operator where we actually call this piece here in, and define that in terms of an operator P. It's easy to see that this is the same as P squared. And we define that to be equal. So this is actually an idempotent operation. There is an important thing here to note. And uh, let me just ask that to you, just to break the monotony from me just speaking here. What is the... Uh, or does this operator have a un ha does this operator have an inverse? Could you use, for instance, this to define a unitary orthogonal transformation? Mm -hmm. So just a, so does this operator have an inverse? You can write in the chat if you want to, or you can just ask answer, mute yourself and answer. Can we define uh, does P inverse? exist? Anyone who can see that on, on the fly here? No. No, exactly. So this is actually, uh, it's going to be an important thing because, and we will see that next week when we are going to look at quantum mechanical operations because the quantum mechanical operations we want to deal with, they have to be so-called unitary operations. Now, a unitary matrix is a matrix where the Hermitian conjugate of the matrix is actually the inverse of the matrix. In this specific case, we cannot use this operator here, which we have defined, to define a, a unitary matrix and a unitary operation. We are coming back to that. But this, has, this operator here has, however, some interesting properties. So let's look at the other one. So the next one we could define is phi two with, no, sorry, phi one with phi one. And we would call this one operator Q. And you can quickly see that Q is equal to Q squared. So I'm putting hats on these to indicate that these are operators, zero and zero one. So the thing which is interesting for us now is the following. Uh, one, these two operators commute. And you can quickly see that equal to zero. Also, if you multiply P with Q, it's equal to zero. So these are normally called idempotent operators. But suppose now that we have defined a general uh, qubit state. 
So we define this general qubit state. Qubit state. And we have the state psi, which is given by an A0 multiplied with phi zero plus an A1 multiplied with phi one. So what we could do next, we could actually operate with P on this uh, general qubit state phi, psi. And when we now perform the operation, this is the same as A100, zero, zero. that's the operator P. And this is now multiplied with A0 and A1. And what we see then is that this simply projects out A0 times the the qubit zero state. Remember now that we also label this as a qubit zero state, and we are gonna use this simple notation here. On the other hand, so what it does is it actually projects out a uh, component of this specific general qubit state. And this is something which we are going to later to connect with measurements. But now I just wanted to define these operators here. And these operators are called projection operators because they project out a specific state from a general qubit state. So if you're gonna make a measurement, this is something which will be the result of a typical measurement. And you see also that if I act with Q on this general state Psi, this is the same as zero, 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 one, acting on A0, A1, and that gives us A1 multiplied with this other computational basis state, which we call phi one, or simply just call for one. So a qubit in such a state then, uh, we can operate with these two operators, P and Q, and we can then project out uh, one of the specific components. And this is something which we can easily generalize to more complicated uh, qubit states, which could be now a linear combination of many more such states. So these are just examples of uh, uh, what typically can be done here. Now. Uh, what we can do also when we have defined this uh, specific qubit states is now to generalize this to, let's say, two qubit states. So what about more complex, more complicated qubit states? So you could now think of having uh, uh, two electrons which are confined in uh, their respective harmonic oscillator traps. So an example here of a physical realization. So you could think of uh, two electrons, one which is confined to move in uh, one oscillator trap. So you have set up electric fields which confines the motion of one electron. We say that we have trapped electrons. So this would be two quantum dots. And these are systems which are actually realized pretty, I shouldn't say easily, but they, they can be realized routinely in, uh, in the lab if you're doing nanotechnology physics or semiconductor physics. In principle, however, and I'm gonna put this, mark this with all these different states, you do actually have an infinity of such single particle states. But now we're just going to pick two of them and we are gonna call this system A. So this is gonna have a label A here. And then we have system uh, a system B, but this is still system A. But system B could now be another electron which is trapped in a harmonic oscillator potentials. So you could actually think of, and this is done routinely in the lab, you could now think of having the electron here and there's now an electron in a harmonic oscillator trap, then we can think of this as, in, as distinguishable systems. They are, they could in principle be identical, but they are actually distinguishable systems. And now we could ask ourselves, I mean, what does a state which is a, a, a what, how do we define a two qubit state based on this specific system here? So we can now define a two qubit state as a tensor product.
and we could take the tensor product of uh, two qubits in zero here and zero for the system B. And in our case, this is now the same as one zero. And now we drop the label A, tensor product with a one zero. And this becomes now a vector of length four, if you go back to the definition of a tensor product. And this is now a new vector, which now has four components. And this is something which is often sloppily just rewritten as zero, zero. Later, we are going to relabel that as a state zero. So that will be typically the first computational basis state which we have. So now what we are doing now is to use this uh, one or single qubit basis states to define a new computational basis because our system has now been extended to have two qubits. And the kind of operations we are going to do here now is something which we will define next week. And these are going to be some of the simpler systems which we will uh, keep uh, looking at throughout this course here. But in principle, we can just extend this to three electrons confined in these quantum dot systems. We can have four electrons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now you see that we can repeat this and we can look at the uh, tensor product of the state 1b here. And that's the same as 1, 0. And then tensor product with 0, 1. And you see immediately that this translates into 0, 1, 0, 0. And we would use a compact notation like 0, 1. And when we are going to make a new basis uh, and label that new basis, we would typically refer this as the second computational basis state for a two qubit system. And now you see that we have, uh, we can take, sorry, we can take, one A tensor product with a zero in B. And this is going to be given by zero one and one zero. And you see that this is a new state which is orthogonal to the previous ones. So one thing you notice now is that the orthogonality is kept. If you take now the, uh, the inner product between this state and the previous one, you will find that that one is equal to zero. And this is something which we will labor later label as a state number three, or actually two since we start counting from zero. And then finally, the final state, and this is the last thing I'm gonna write down today. And you can easily see that this becomes zero, 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 one. And this is often written as one, one, or just state number three, when you count from zero. Now, these are our new computational basis states. And this kind of notation uh, is the typical notation you're going to encounter in uh, basically all quantum computation courses. So this one is actually the tensor product of two states here. And uh, uh, we would normally rewrite this in terms of this kind of sloppier notation or more compact notation. And you see now that these four vectors here, which are in a principle an idealization of a system or two quantum dot systems which have an infinity of basis states where we now simply have single out the two lowest states in each of these systems and we are going to treat these as the computational states so the reason why i come back to this now at the end of the lecture is that when we are looking at real systems they are going to be complicated many body systems with an infinity of states but then what we are doing now is simply to idealize the systems which we have and pick some selected states. And when many uh, researchers are looking after systems which are candidates for making, uh, let's say quantum circuits or candidate systems for quantum technologies, one tries often to figure out whether the system exhibits some very, very distinct uh, two level systems which they can be used as basis states for quantum computations. So I want you to keep this in mind because in textbooks you will see the kind of notation which we have here and that is often disconnected 
from the actual physics. And we are actually coming back to this a little bit later when we are going to study our first quantum computing calculations here. But this is wh where I wanted to stop today. Uh, so we've gone through some basic quantum mechanics, which, and I hope I didn't offend you guys, because you've probably seen many of these things before. Uh, but I just wanted to remind you of some of these basic definitions of states. And then next week, we are going to look at specific uh, matrices, which we're going to translate into quantum gates, and with which we can make specific operations on these states. So everything which we, you do when you do quantum computations from an experimental point of view is that you have to realize some quantum mechanical operations either by applying lasers to these quantum dot systems. So you could think of you exciting this electron up to an excited state here. And that can be rewritten in terms of specific mathematical operations. And this is what we are going to look at in more detail next week. So we will need this first three weeks uh, to actually define some of the basic operations and basic definitions. Now, there are some exercises which follow in a textbook by Scherer. And uh, uh, I re recommend taking a look at it. I'm going to revise a little bit my lecture notes. And I will also put in some weekly uh, assignments, which you can look at. But not this first week here, because I would like to have some feedback from you on what you want to do here. Since this was previously a self-study special topic course, where people actually define their own paths. The path here is that I would like to lead us all to the first project, which is a project where we are going to take a simpler quantum uh, mechanical Hamiltonian, and we are going to translate the quantum mechanical Hamiltonian in terms of Pauli matrices, which are then going to be represented by specific uh, mathematical operations, which we translate into gates and quantum circuits. And then we're going to use these to actually calculate or find the, let's say, the ground state energy of a specific Hamiltonian. So the first project which I am thinking of defining is a project where we actually deal with uh, an actual quantum computation in order to extract eigenvalues of a quantum mechanical system. And then the next project is something which uh, I would be more than happy to uh, to have input from you guys. And then these two projects uh, can be used. You can think of these as a kind of continuous midterm, which we work throughout the semester. And then they can be used uh, to make the final presentation. This is one possible path. So I'm going to stop the recording here and the recording will be uploaded. And I will also correct the, uh, the Zoom link so that people can actually log in here next time.